Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. The question we would like to answer from the scriptures tonight is this. Does God heal in this dispensation of grace? Now, this seems to be a simple question when we look at it. However, its ramifications are actually quite mind-boggling. Now, consider this for a moment. On the one side, there are those that say that we have the authority and prerogative to command healing in this dispensation. So, they would command sickness and illness in Jesus' name, claiming promises given to a different audience and a different dispensation. The result, some are healed, but the vast majority are not. What happens there? What went wrong? Now, on the other side, there are those that say that God no longer heals in this dispensation of grace because the gifts of healings have already ceased. But yet, we do pray for the sick, expecting God to heal, right? The result, again, some are healed, and again, a vast majority are not. Now, what went wrong this time? Now, it becomes more confusing. So, does God or does not God heal in this dispensation of grace? Now, let us see what the scriptures say. Now, the word heal and its related terms such as healed, health, healeth, heal, healer, healing, and healings, occur a total of 159 times in the scriptures. It occurs 81 times in the Old Testament and 78 times in the New Testament. Now, we know that God deals differently to different people in different times in different dispensations. Now, with that in mind, we have to see that God deals differently differently with man in three distinct and unique times. This would be in times past, but now, and in the age to come. You know what's surprising about our scriptures is that it is actually arranged to progress in that same way. Now, we would see God's dealing in times past from the books of Genesis to the book of Acts. Now, these books show God's dealings with Israel from its foundation with Abraham to its diminishing in the book of Acts, where Israel rejected God the Father in the Old Testament, rejected God the Son, Jesus Christ, in the Gospels, and Israel rejected God the Holy Spirit by rejecting the apostles in the book of Acts. Now, did you know that from Genesis to Acts, <clears throat> the term heal and its related terms occur a total of 149 times. Next, we can see God's dealing in the but now from the epistles of Romans to Philemon. Now, you would notice that these books would comprise the epistles of the Apostle Paul. We have to remember and bear in mind that the Apostle Paul is our apostle because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Don't take my word for it, but you can check from the scriptures from Romans chapter 11 verse 13 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, the Apostle Paul clearly calls himself the Apostle to the Gentiles. And there's more. The Apostle Paul is also the spokesperson of God for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. Now, we could see that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 2. 
Because the Apostle Paul is the spokesperson for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace, the Apostle Paul can make the claim saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, The things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. See, the Apostle Paul is our Apostle and he is the spokesperson for this dispensation of grace. Now, from the books of Romans to Philemon, the term heal and its related terms occur a total of three times. Lastly, we can see God's dealing in the age to come from the epistles of Hebrews to Revelation. Now, this dispensation is a continuation of the previous dispensation where God's program and promise, promise to Israel shall be completed. This time is called the day of the Lord or the day of Jacob's trouble, commonly known as the tribulation period. And its end would be the millennial kingdom and ultimately the new heaven and the new earth. Now from Hebrews to Revelation, the term heal and its related terms occur a total of seven times. Now from there, we could make and have the sense of how God heals or deals with healing diseases, sicknesses, and ailments in this dispensation of grace. But let us continue to consider other parts of scriptures. Now we have to understand, first of all, the core concept of healing. Now here is a biblical truth. We see in the scriptures that God is the ultimate source of life. Now you, if you have your Bibles with you, let me show you from Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, that God is indeed the ultimate source of life. And this starts from the very beginning where God created man. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7 says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God is the ultimate source of life. As a matter of fact, it is only after the fall of man, when sin entered into the world, and with sin came death, and to facilitate death, disease and illness. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 made this very clear, where the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, since the Lord God is the ultimate source of life, we have to understand that healing belongs to the Lord God. Truth is, the first occurrence of the term heal, which is actually the term healed, is in Genesis chapter 20, verse number 7. Now, let's turn to that. Genesis chapter 20, verse number 7. This is what the scriptures say. And this is what the scriptures say about the first occurrence of the term heal. Genesis chapter 20 verse number 17, the word of God says, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. It is God who healed Abimelech. As God is the source of life, ultimately, it is God who heals. Now, throughout scriptures, we would see how God healed. For Israel, in their dispensation, the Lord God actually promised healing. And let's turn this time to Exodus chapter 15, verse number 26. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 26. 
and we would see the promise of healing that is given to Israel and its condition. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 26, the word of God says this. Now we have to bear in mind who is talking and who is being addressed. This is Moses talking and he is talking to the children of Israel. This is God's covenant with them. Bear that in mind. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 26 says this. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. Did you notice the conditions? Let's continue reading. This is God's promise. He says, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Note that this promise was only given to Israel and it is with the condition of their total and complete obedience to the law of the Lord. The result of their obedience is long life and it is done by the preservation of health and the healing from diseases. We have to be very careful that the promises that we claim in scriptures, whether it's given to Israel, we cannot claim it. And that's the problem in many people's understanding of the scriptures today. They claim promises that were not given to them and they are disappointed that God broke those promises. That doesn't make sense, right? God keeps His promise to whom He promised them. Now, this promise of healing is later on enforced by the Lord Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry in Israel. Do you remember that one of the most interesting and attention-grabbing facets of the ministry of Jesus Christ, aside from His miracles, would actually be His healings? The Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the rightful King of Israel, as the Messiah, healed Israel of her sickness, affliction, diseases. And that shows that He is indeed the Christ, Israel's Messiah, and the rightful King. Now, this was actually the point of Christ's healings in the Gospels. And this is how God heals in times past and it is for Israel and in their dispensation. So the next question that we want to see, but how about in this dispensation of grace for us Gentiles? For us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace, we are under a unique and distinct sets of truth when it comes to healing. Now, we ask the question, was not the term heal and its related terms mentioned three times in the Pauline epistles? Yes, it is. Now, we can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9, verse number 28, and verse number 30. Now, wait a minute. The only three occurrences of the terms for heal and its related terms are all found in one epistle and in one chapter? Now that says a lot, but let's turn to it. Let's look at first, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. So this is what the Apostle Paul says. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Now, this time, we would see that healing is given as a spiritual gift. Now, the same is actually seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 28. And if you would look at that, it simply says, And God hath sent 
some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Again, spiritual gift of healing. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 30? Now, this is what the scripture says. It says, Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Once again, it's the same. It's talking about a spiritual gift of healing. Now, what is important to note about this spiritual gift of healing, as well as the other gifts mentioned in that pericope, is what is written in the very next verse. Apostle Paul says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. There is a more excellent way than the gift of healings. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, also known as the charity chapter, shows us what Apostle Paul means of what the more excellent way is. Now, if you would read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, the Apostle Paul mentioned the gifts again, and in contrast with charity, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Now, what's the point? Now, you may see that you may have these gifts that Paul highlights in 1 Corinthians 13. Here, he highlights the gifts of tongues, prophecy, knowledge, and miracles. Now, this part of the other gifts is also listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, let's turn to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 to 10, shows us a list of gifts represented of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's begin a reading from verse number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8 to 10 says this, For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gift of gifts of healings, healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So remember those cluster words. Now, those gifts are represented by the gifts highlighted in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, what is noticeable about these gifts? Now, let me bring your attention to Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20. Mark chapter 15, verses 15 to 20. And this would show us what these gifts are about. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20. Now, we would see that this is the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the apostles, sending them to preach the gospel. But what gospel? We'll see. 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 20 says this, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. That shows us a dispensational context of this narrative as the Lord sending his apostles to minister to Israel and the world through Israel under the gospel of the kingdom in their dispensation. Now, what's the commission? It says to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, to give us an idea or hint 
that this is not the same gospel preached by the Apostle Paul. Let's continue reading verse number 16. He says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, wait a minute. Since when did the Apostle, uh, since when does the gospel preached by the Apostle Paul includes baptism, water baptism? But that's clearly what is being taught here, right? The Lord Jesus tells the disciples to preach the gospel and whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. But the Apostle Paul said, Christ sent him not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The gospel that the apostles preached is called the gospel of the kingdom, and it presents that Jesus is the Christ, and hearing who Jesus is, Israel and the world is to respond by, by accepting him as their Lord and their rightful king. But for the, gospel of the dispens uh, for the gospel of the grace of God in this dispensation of grace, the preaching is who Christ is, being the Christ, and what he has done. His death on the cross for our sins, burial, and resurrection. To hear that gospel, the only response is to trust, believing that what Christ has done is sufficient to save eternally. So, this gospel is not the same as the Apostle Paul's gospel. Now, what is this gospel followed with? Let's continue reading verse number 17. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe, that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with New tongues. Mind that. Next, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, see, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat, da, sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now, no wonder those gifts are called sign gifts. Now, here's an idea. When was the last time you, when you preached the gospel, performed these signs? Wouldn't that be the commission? But no, it's for a different audience in a different dispensation, and they are to preach a gospel for that dispensation. The Apostle Paul is entrusted the gospel of the grace of God, which he delivered unto us, which we heard, and by which we stand and trust in Christ. And our only prerogative is to declare that gospel. No signs following with us. You see? Now, what are these signs for? Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse number 22, and this would actually clear up why the signs were given and what the signs are for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22, what are the signs for? The Word of God says this, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So, the church in Corinth, at the time of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, is composed of both a Jew and Gentile audience. Hence, the existence of sign gifts for the Jews at the time. Now, what will happen to these sign gifts, such as tongues, prophecy, and wisdom? According to what the Apostle Paul says, and that would include healing healing, 
and some of those gifts. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. This is what the Word of God says. It says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now when shall they cease? Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The sign gifts will be done away when that which is perfect is come. And at the time of the writing of the Apostle Paul of 2 Timothy, God's revelation in the scriptures is completed. That's why, if you would turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, the Word of God says this. The Apostle Paul declares, saying, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, since we have the perfect word of God in the scriptures, which is the King James Bible, and that the ministry has fully come to the Gentiles, the sign gifts have been done away and have already vanished. So the question is, <clears throat> how about healing for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace? If, we, if the sign gifts have already ceased and we have no command nor prerogative to Command healing. What about healing in this dispensation of grace? Now, it would help us to remember what is written by our Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 16, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus might show forth all long suffering. Now here's the word. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now notice that the Apostle Paul is God's pattern for us which should hereafter believe on Christ to life everlasting. Now, if the Apostle Paul is our pattern, what did the Apostle Paul exemplify regarding healing in his own life? Now let me turn your attention this time to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. And this is about the disease or illness or a thorn in the flesh that the Apostle Paul did have. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 8, says this, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. See? He besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul talking. He has a thorn in the flesh. For all pragmatic reasons, he should have been healed by the Lord God, right? It would make ministry more efficient. It's like he's the Apostle to the Gentiles. He should be healthy. He should be disease-free. He should be thorn-free. But Paul did have a thorn in the flesh. And he asked the Lord thrice, three times he asked the Lord that it should depart him. But what was he given? Verse number nine. 
it is said. And he said unto me, the Lord speaks to Paul, saying, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My friends, our Apostle Paul lived with some sort of a disease with his thorn in the flesh. As a matter of fact, Timothy had to take a little wine for his stomach, obviously for some ailment reasons. Trophimus was also left in Militum sick. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. The instruction about the wine for Timothy's stomach is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. So you see, my friends, sickness had beset the Apostle Paul and company. Now, why didn't the Apostle Paul heal his co-ministers in the gospel? Why didn't the Apostle Paul heal himself of his thorn in the flesh? Now, this actually shows us, believers in this dispensation of grace, the norm for healing in this dispensation. Our Apostle Paul was allowed by God to suffer with his thorn, given the explanation that his grace is sufficient for him. That makes us who remain in the bed of infirmity, according to the sovereign will of God, would have the same ever-sufficient grace to sustain us through it all. Understanding this, made the Apostle Paul resolve, saying, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, why is this important to understand? Why is it important to understand that when it comes to disease, to illness, to ailments, it's the norm for believers. It's important to understand because of what the Apostle Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. We have to understand what we actually have. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10 says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. The Apostle Paul writes this word saying, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, that we, but in God which raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Now, my friends, we have to understand, we had the sentence of death in us. Now, this is because of sin. We understand that. Because the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. But God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, by virtue of the gospel message, of Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection, we who trust in Christ are delivered from so great a death. Now that speaks about eternal death. But then, we await of a future where God shall deliver us from death, ultimately, when He raiseth the dead. Now, we read of this hope in Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 23. The Word of God says this. Romans chapter 8, 
verse 18 to 23, the Apostle Paul writes this word saying, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had, who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. See? Illness, ailment, sicknesses, that's norm. That's the norm. And that's to be expected. We groan. For what? Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Now what are we waiting for? It says, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. So believers in this dispensation of grace get sick and many actually remain in the bed of infirmity. Again, my friends, this is the norm and this is meant for us to understand the grace that we have received and the hope of being delivered from this present evil world. Now, for those whom God sovereignly wills to keep in disease, He sustains us by His ever-sufficient grace. But remember, all believers will ha have the hope, all believers have the hope to have our mortal and decaying bodies redeemed and in the end be raised incorruptible. Now on that day, we can declare what is written in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 to 57, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks, to God, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, sickness is the norm for the believer that we may not be too at home in this world which is not our home and in these bodies that shall one day be redeemed and that we should not focus on the earthly blessings when our blessings are actually spiritual and in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, understanding this truth and coming to terms with this reality that sickness, diseases, ailments, that's the norm for believers would actually help us to be thankful for the health that we do have and take necessary precautions and take care of our health. But here's the good thing. Norm, sickness, ailments, that's the norm. But here's the good thing. Let me turn your attention this time to Philippians chapter 2, verse 25 to 27. Now this would give us the reason why we actually pray whenever we're sick or when someone we love or someone we care about are sick. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25 to 27, the Word of God says this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25 to 27, the Apostle Paul talks about a man named Epaphroditus. He says, verse 25, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he 
that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. Oh, here's another person in Paul's team that got sick. Verse 27, For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. Now, here's what happened to him. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when ye see him, see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Meet the exception, Epaphroditus to whom God had mercy and healed him, preserving his life. Remember, God is the ultimate source of life and healing belongs to him. So God can heal according to his mercy in this dispensation of grace. God can heal. Now for this reason, we can beseech God for healing and remedy for our diseases, appealing to His mercy. But that's not the norm. That is the exception. Now, this brings us to the believer's mindset regarding healing in this dispensation of grace. Here's the picture. When God heals, it is because of His mercy. When God doesn't heal, He supplies Ever sufficient grace. Both are according to his sovereign purpose and his sovereign will. Now we have to bear in mind this truth declared by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 7 to 9, when it regards to healing or our being kept in continued affliction and disease. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 to 9, the Apostle Paul writes these words and says an important truth we have to understand. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 to 9, it says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. The dead and living. So we live unto the Lord. We die unto the Lord. In between, we get sick, we suffer diseases, we have these infirmities. God may heal according to His mercy. God may sovereignly keep us in illness, sustaining us with His ever-sufficient grace. But in all this, we look forward to that day when God will redeem our bodies and deliver us from this present evil world. Now, until that time, this is how we live our Christian lives. It is written in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In life and in death, we are the Lord's. In sickness and in health, it is God who is sovereign, merciful, and gracious. We live our lives, we live our life in the flesh, not by our own faith, not by our own strength, but by the faith 
of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. So does God heal in this dispensation of grace? God heals according to his mercy. God allows sickness to ravage, ravage on, but he sustains with his ever-sufficient grace. The bottom line is that the end is not in this world, nor in this life, but in the day when God shall raise our mortal bodies incorruptible and let us not lose sight of that truth. But this begs the question tonight, have you settled that eternity? Now, if not, here is how. Know that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh, who died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again for our justification. That's clearly stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4. to and the moment that we trust in Christ, believing that His death for our sins, burial, and resurrection is sufficient for our eternal salvation and absolute justification, we are saved and sealed until the redemption of the purchased possession. You can check that out in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. So have you settled this? If yes, then praise God. But maybe at this time, you wrestle with sickness or illness or disease. I pray that you may see that when God heals, it is because of His mercy. When God keeps you in the bed of illness, remember, He supplies His ever-sufficient grace. Both are according to His sovereign purpose. Which one are you going through right now? If the Lord God healed you, then praise the Lord for His mercy. If the Lord in His sovereign will keeps you in the bed of infirmity, then praise God for His ever-sufficient grace that keeps you even until now. Remember, it is written in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13, 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let me pray for you tonight. Father, we thank you for this truth about healing, that when you heal, it is because of your mercy. And when you sovereignly will to let illness progress, and continue. We thank you for your ever-sufficient grace to sustain us even until now. We thank you, Father God, for this truth. And we thank you that our hope is not in this world, but that our bodies would be redeemed and we shall be delivered from this present evil world that we may not trust in ourselves, but in you who raiseth the dead. I pray, Father God, that we would settle these truths in our hearts and the truths that we have received from your word simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcast. On Monday, we will have the broadcast of the precepts from the Proverbs. On Thursday, we have the online Bible study, this time in the book of 2 Thessalonians. And hope to catch you again next week for another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.